Hello strategy gaming enthusiasts, my name is Alzebo HD, and in today's video, we are going to take a deep dive into the most challenging characters to play in Crusader Kings 3. These ruinous rulers are practically impossible to play, and through a combination of ghastly genetics, imminent invasions, or the inability to sire spawnlings require spicy strategies to pull off successfully. In this video, we will cover 10 of the most impossible starts in the entire game, and detail the worst characters that range from the lowest of Siberian counts to the highest of Anglo-Saxon kings. And speaking of kingdoms, this video is sponsored by March of Empires. March of Empires is a free-to-play MMO strategy game full of war, intrigue, and conquest. Just as in Crusader Kings, March of Empires places you into a kingdom where you employ diplomacy and conquest to rise to the top of power and become emperor of your lands. But becoming a powerful king is easier when you play with your friends, and as a multiplayer strategy game, March of Empires allows you to team up to outmaneuver your opponents, and personally I find the art style and graphics to be quite pleasing. Your decisions impact the whole world, and allow you to rise through the ranks and obtain titles to your kingdom, like that of the Spy Master, Marshal, and Sovereign themselves. By building a kingdom and vanquishing your opponents, you too can take the crown of Emperor. Support the channel and download March of Empires for free using the link below. A special thanks as well to March of Empires for sponsoring this video. Baruch Atah Adonai and Shalom to the court of Rastawit of Dambia in the 867 starting date. This 33-year-old African Jewish count hails from Beta Israel, one of the legendary lost tribes of the Holy Land that fled the Levant after the destruction of the First Temple. As the head of the Gideon dynasty, Dawit is surrounded on all sides by hostile Coptic Christians and Kushites, painting him a target for repeated holy wars and title revocations by his liege, the Prince of Abyssinia. Dawit starts his campaign with one heir and must Hava Nagila Hava a bride in order to revive his fabled dynasty. While Dawit is no King David, experienced players can restore the Third Temple and reforge the Kingdom of Israel if they are able to defend their way into Palestine, the Golan Heights, and the Sinai Peninsula. But Magyar Ethiopia isn't challenging enough for you, in which case you're looking for Countess Catalan of Pajonia in the 1066 starting date. Stuck in a patriarchal marriage at 38 years old and without a dynastic heir, Catalan hasn't much time to produce progeny before menopause manifests and guarantees you a game over. This is because all of her children are of her husband's dynasty, but wait, it gets worse. Catalan is unable to swap her spouse, as that requires piety and, more importantly, the permission of the Pope. She has about three or four years of fertility to either change religions to allow for a divorce or to seduce another man to legitimize an heir of her own dynasty. In our campaign, she was chast, and her seduction target was also chast, but true love knows no boundaries. Even if you succeed at cucking your husband and siring a matriarchal heir, you'll probably be placed together in prison and stripped of your respective titles. Up next on our list of strenuous starting scenarios is the Enfante Fuera Ordones of Asturias. This blinded, Visigothic, teenaged one province count suffers from poor vision, an even poorer stat spread, and an absolutely abysmal health modifier. But being blind has its perks, as the ill-fated Enfante cannot possibly see the Umayyad Caliphate to the south, France to the east, and the Viking Heistein to the north all of whom will likely invade and annex him within the next few years. Senor Ordonis has claims to titles across the Kingdom of Asturias, but with less than 200 levies doesn't have the ability to enforce them. Even if you marry a distant cousin to secure more armies and press your claims, you'd only invite Muslim, French, and Norse invasions, as you'd end up weakening your liege and dividing your realm's power base. If you are somehow able to save poor Fruella's position, however, you can opt to form Portugal and bless the trade down in Africa. But if you thought being blind was bad, you should try being Armenian. Count Sumbat of Swanik in the 1066 starting date is an incapable one province count that starts the game on death's door and surrounded by the Seljuk Sultanate superpower. 
His incapable trait prevents him from siring offspring, pushes his stats into the zeros, and practically guarantees that he dies within a few months from starting your campaign. While he does have a dynastic heir, that will do nothing to protect his dying dynasty from a Turkic takeover by the surrounding Seljuks, who have over 25,000 levies compared to your 300 Surinavans. While having a system of a down syndrome prevents him from restoring Greater Armenia, Sambat's less incapable half-brother heir can theoretically reconquer the Caucasus and subjugate the Seljuks under Swanic sovereignty. Up next on our list of challenging campaigns is Emir Sadun of the Sadunid Emirate. In the 867 starting date, this Sunni overlord of Sicilian lands starts his campaign at war with the Kingdom of Italy, which fields an army two to three times bigger than that of his own. To make matters worse, the rulers of Europe, known as the Carling Crew, have a tendency to occasionally join in on the war as well. If you marry your starting heir to a distant cousin, you might be able to snag an alliance, but it's far more likely that the war will end in a complete disaster. Once you lose your titles, you'll still have to contend with the wrong culture and wrong religion kafir from whom you enact jizya, who themselves have a tendency to revolt while you're at war. Inshallah, you'll survive the first holy war intact, in which case you now border both the Holy Roman and Byzantine empires, placing you at the crossroads of two Romes and making a future crusade against you all but a guarantee. Heading by call to Asia is child chieftain Artrock of Goose Cole in the 1066 starting date. This six-year-old Siberian is in for a rough ride, and believes in a religion that everyone else considers hostile, and is first in line to inherit zero development land. In fact, Siberia is the worst region in the game, and possesses zero development across all provinces of the steppe. As a child count, Artrock starts with a zero in almost every stat, and his tribal government form and Manichian religion ensure that his state is permanently unstable. The neighboring kingdoms of Kumania, Zetsu, and Kocho all possess thousands of troops that want to take your worthless land for themselves, and you only have two to three hundred men to defend yourself. And if that wasn't bad enough, Chinggis Khan himself will descend upon the Siberian steppe in about a hundred years, bringing tens of thousands of Mongolian event troops that will absolutely steamroll anything you might have been able to preserve in the interceding years. If you are able to step up, ally enormous kingdoms to your south, and plan your battles in defensive terrain along the Ural Mountains, you might just be able to transform your tribal child count into a steppe sovereign. Playing with fire is Marzaban Wasudan of Gilan, the fourth most difficult ruler to play in all of CK3. As the only Zoroastrian independent ruler in the 867 starting date, Wasudan's position is precarious. He holds only one county, and his Mazdayan fire temples are nearly guaranteed to be extinguished by the neighboring Abbasid Caliphate and the Alavid and Dulafid Emirates. These powerful polities outnumber his troops more than 10 to 1, and with only 239 levies to his name, Wasudan can only pray to Ahura Mazda as he lacks the funds needed to hire mercenaries or men-at-arms. If you are exceptionally lucky and reject divine marriages to marry outside of your family, you might be able to scratch an alliance to garner meager military support, which might bring the odds closer to 8 to 1. And if you're exceptionally skilled and or Mazdaikistic, it's technically possible, though incredibly improbable, that you can use him to form the Persian Empire, embrace Nauru's, and restore Zoroastrianism to Persia by becoming the Syoshant. If you are a fan of hopeless wars and unending invasions, you'll love Petty King Ayala of Northumbria in the 867 starting date. Ayala starts his campaign with two Viking invasions that outnumbers him more than 5 to 1 before the battle's begun, but then the winged raiding parties arrive, raiding down from the coastal side and sacking his cities while remaining officially out of the war. His starting alliances with Mercia and Wessex are too far away to offer much meaningful help, and the most likely outcome is that Ayla loses all of his lands, titles, and hits a game over within two years of starting his campaign. If you pray to the high heavens and are in Jesus, you might survive both of these wars intact, 
in which case you'll benefit from his above average stat spread, kingdom tier title, and plethora of progeny to take the throne in subsequent secessions. And speaking of secessions, our next hapless head of state has none. Clocking in at 69 years young is Countess Gaida, Torgil's daughter, of Devon in the 1066 starting date. This postmenopausal maiden not only has no children, but is long past capable of bearing her own, resulting in an immediate game over when she passes the mortal coil. While it is functionally impossible to obtain an heir in her campaign, Reddit user Blue Waffle revealed a strategy that uses RNG and a bit of luck to have her unlock Tanistry Secession. The basic idea is to unlock the whole of body lifestyle path to gain bonus health, which potentially enables you to live long enough to convert your culture to Cornish, conquer Cornwall to form a ducky, and unlock the 1500 piety needed to change your realm secession laws. With Tanistry unlocked, you can then nominate an heir from among your dynastic members, allowing you to avoid a game over. That being said, she's still 70 years old in medieval times, and if the pilgrimages for piety doesn't kill her, her children surely will. In fact, all ten of your children want you to die, so that they can inherit your title and your lands, and they'll often declare war on you, as they've done in my campaign. With a chance to die every month from campaign start, even if you do everything correctly, 99% of the time you'll end up at a game over and put your campaign into a retirement home. Chopping his way onto the top and final position on our list of impossible campaigns is Shaikh Munis of Acre in the 867 starting date. This Greek cultured eunuch is unable to marry nor sire children, which functionally guarantees a game over as you'll be without an heir for your secession. In CK2, you were able to embrace Shaitan to restore your satanic seed, but unfortunately no such feature yet exists in Crusader Kings 3. Consequently, Munis's position is desperate and requires complicated cuckoldery techniques to pass off other men's children as his own. To prevent a game over, Munis players will have to either adopt a foreign religion or reform Sunni Islam to allow for concubines, which you can then use to cuck yourself into quote, legitimate, unquote, children. It's best to select concubines that already have lovers or have attractive congenital traits to speed along this process of dynastic deprivation. If you'd like to see a narrated adventure of Munis and his quest to conjure his long-lost cojones, I invite you to check out the card at the top right of your screen, where we complete this challenge in Crusader Kings 2. Before ending the video, I'd like to thank everyone for watching this far and supporting the YouTube algorithm. If you'd like to see more content and want to help the channel grow, I'd also suggest fabricating a claim on the like button and usurping the channel's subscription box. This video was made in partnership with March of Empires, and if you'd like to learn more about the game, I invite you to check out the link in the description box below. If you want to boost relations even more, you should consider donating to our Patreon, buying games through our Nexus store, or donating basic attention tokens to Alzo HD through the Brave browser. As always, more content is on the way this month, and without further ado, it's time now to roll the credits.